So in today's video, you're going to meet an agent that I'm coaching right now. He's the number one agent in the entire state of Utah. This guy for 20 years has been at the top of his game. He's selling about 250 houses a year by himself with one assistant. He doesn't have this 10-person team and they're all doing 10 deals a year. No, he's doing between 240, 260 deals every single year, earning between 1.5 and $2 million a year. We're going to break down his entire business. He's going to share with you what he's doing to generate new business. He's going to talk about what he's doing to get repeat and referral business. And here's the key thing. We're very honest. We're very transparent in this interview. Like We're going to share some of the things. When I say we, guys that have been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years, what it really takes to play at an elite level. We're not talking about selling 8, 10, 12, 14 houses a year. We're talking about someone who holds right now, uh, I think he has 45 active listings, over 25 pending listings in his active inventory. And so I believe you will get a couple pages of notes during this interview. And of course, as you're watching the interview, if you also want help from a coaching perspective to help you reach elite status as a listing agent, I'm going to put a link right underneath this video, both in the, in the description and in the pinned comment. Feel free. You can click that link, schedule a day and time that works best for you learn about the Listing Agent Academy coaching program, and then make a decision if it's for you or not. So with that, let's jump into today's interview. All right. So Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate you jumping you. on with us this morning. And to dive in, if you don't mind, kind of tee this up, let us know what market are you in and, and how long have you been selling real estate? So I'm in Utah. So I work out of my uh, St. George office, which is very similar to the Vegas climate. We're about an hour and a half north of Las Vegas. That's kind of where all the northern Utahns tend to seek refuge in the the winter. Uh, and then uh, currently right now, I'm in my Salt Lake office. I had a couple of appointments up here today. So I'll be up here today and then flying back down to St. George tonight. I love it. I love it. And so for the audience, you know, what type of production have you been doing? Or actually, a better question would be, what did you do in 2022 and what's the goal for 2023? So 2022, uh, we had a pretty significant decrease in sales. The fourth quarter was pretty dismal. Um, it was 212 sales in um, 2022 with my one assistant. And she's a lot more than assistant, so I hate to even use that term sure. assistant. I mean, she is everything in the office. I mean, she does the work of four people. Um, 179 of those were listings. Um, and then 2021 was 258, if I believe. And then the year before that was 265. So Got it. the goal is always one per business day for me. Um, sure. Obviously, you know, the markets don't determine, you know, what you make or what you sell, but what you have to do to accomplish the goals that you want. So obviously we're having to move quickly to make adjustments, of course, to make sure we stay on track with those goals and everything. I love it. I love it. And yeah, I totally agree. I've always, you know, for the almost 20 years I've been in the business, always have built a business plan off of 240 working business days. And there's no reason why we can't have a closing a day. And so that kind of seems to be in alignment with with your beliefs as well. Absolutely. And so I want to talk about um, how you've been able to do that. And so tell me again, how long have you been selling? So about 20 years. So this yeah. uh, this December will mark 21 years. So I've been in the business literally since I turned 18. It was three days after I turned 18, I activated my license. And so this is the only thing that I've done. And uh, obviously that, you know, to get to 240 transactions or 265, um, you know, obviously when you start looking at teams, then th that can change that dynamic dramatically, of course. And I always laugh at, you know, we go to some of these big national conventions, like, oh, 1,500, I'm like, oh, everybody only did 20 transactions. That's not very impressive, you know? So that's uh, but exactly we do, right. My, my office has a team that does a little over 450 with, with about 10 agents. So obviously a little bit more impressive there. Um, and it's the 20 years obviously adds in a huge advantage because, you know, 32, 33% of those transactions are past clients and referrals walking in the door every single day for me. 
And so a lot of time when working with newer agents or agents that have only been in the business five or 10 years, we have to look at that more realistically, you know, without holding them back, of course, but realistically looking at it saying, okay, it's going to take some time to grow this. You can't, you know, jump onto the basketball court or the golf course and, and just assume, okay, I'm going to shoot par today. It's like, okay, we got to build those skills up first and, and, and build the connections and references. Um, and, and even I'll be honest, I, one of the things I always talk about, I was on the phone with Remax Gold, which is the largest Remax in the country production. And, you know, we had to be honest with a lot of the agents and, and upfront in that I remember vividly. I mean, I used to have to keep a bottle of Pepto in the car and, and Alka-Seltzer because when I'd go to knock on doors, because 20 years ago when we got into the business, there were text messages. That's right. Right. We didn't have some of the technology we have today, which I think is holding a lot of agents back because they want to take the path of least resistance. That's right. And they, and they don't want to do the ugly stuff and the ugly stuff and everything in life, whether it's sports or sales is what produces the best results. You know, the face-to-face, -face, the voice-to-voice, -voice, you know, that, that interaction to separate yourself from the competition. So I hated knocking on doors. I hated, I mean, I would literally make myself sick. And it took about a year to get past that. And once you got past that, it was now I, now I feel guilty. You know, if I'm going up to the ski mountain tomorrow or Saturday morning, I'll have all my calls in the car with me before I hit the slopes. You know, lunchtime, I'll hit them again. Sunday, same thing. I'm going to hit the new ones on Sunday morning before I hit the slopes. So once you create the routine, it's just, it's like you feel guilty if you don't do your daily exercise or your daily coffee or, or anything else. And it's so, you know, everything for me starts with the schedule. Um, yeah. The night before with my sleep pattern, making sure I've got the energy to fuel the day. And then from there, it's like, okay, we've got to have that schedule dialed down, especially the prospecting hours, literally down to the minute. You know, yeah. you, it's, you only have so many working hours in a day. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, and thank you for all of that, by the way. And yeah, I mean, if, if people were just to rewind the last three minutes, Ryan, of you talking, you dropped all of the very, very important key fundamentals and really what, what they are, are the personality traits of a successful salesperson that most people are missing. Because to your point, they're looking to take the path of least resistance always. I just made a video before we hopped on this interview talking about the two things at play for most realtors. And that is this, this, this constant battle between instant and delayed gratification. And as you know, most agents are always taking the path of least resistance. What is the thing that gives me instant gratification? And as an example, the thing that you reminded me of is instead of prospecting or generating business, I'm going to go and buy leads or I'm going to go start a team. And often what happens is those people, as you know, live a career of regret. Because they wake up in 20 years, I just talked about this, with no database. They're not getting 30% repeat and referral business. What are they doing? Well, they're still chasing Zillow leads because the whole time, the whole 20 years they've been in the business, they refused to pay the price to win long term. They wanted it now. And so now they wake up 20 years still chasing these internet leads. And I think that's exactly what you're alluding to. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like anything else, the same agents that have that mentality, it's interesting because I'll usually kind of flip it when we're having conversations and not that I know the right way or the best way or anything else. Sure. I just know the way that's produced results that a lot of other agents would like. And let's be honest. So I, I like to be on the phones with agents that are doing 350, 400 deals a year with one or two assistants because they push me to say, okay, yeah, you need to pick up the pace. You need to grind yeah. out a little bit harder. And if we flip it to how they raise their kids, right? Because most of them have kids, especially in Utah, right? Everybody has yeah. a ton of kids in Utah. So, you know, we flip it and say, would you allow your kids to take that same approach to school or anything else? Absolutely mm -hmm. not, right? Yep. And, and just for some reason, though, when they get into business, they feel okay uh, taking that path of least resistance and those Zillow leads. But if they want to get in shape or change their nutrition, you know, they have to make that hard decision of, okay, I'm going to get back on that treadmill and it is going to suck for 
a couple of months. Yeah. Right. Physically is, is one aspect of getting in shape, but with prospecting, it's also emotionally getting into shape to be able to do that. You know, when agents try to come in and do three and a half hours of prospecting four hours straight, most of them can't do it. Physically they can, but right. mentally they just, you know, it's like after the third FU, they're done. That's right. You know, for 100%. Me, I'm like, okay, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. All yeah. right. One, one of these is going to say yes now, right? Yeah, that's so. exactly right. And I look at I look at the game of succeeding in real estate sales very similar to that of getting physically fit and the process being very very similar because I think you nailed it. It's that even even in the world of people looking to lose weight and they want to go to the gym one time, they want the magic pill literally to take a pill, pull up their shirt and hopefully look for abs. Do I have any abs yeah. yet? No, no, it does, doesn't work that way. It's really boring. It's very mundane. It takes consistency. So let's let's get into some some details for a minute. So I want people to understand what you said just so they didn't miss it because you hit it. I mean, we're not talking to a person who's doing 250 deals with 10 agents that are all doing 10 deals. We're talking to one human that's doing 250 deals. What type of income or GCI does that represent for you in your market roughly? So my market is a little bit uh, smaller, um, about 158,000 people, but that counts a university as well that just went D1. Um, and we have a lot of winter birds. So I'm going to say 25% of that. And again, people play games with their taxes on the primary residence exemptions, sure. right? So we don't really truly have the real numbers, but based on professional experience, I'm going to say 30% uh, of that is winter birds, right? Yeah. And so let's just say 110, 120,000 people in the county covers about a 45 minute drive from one end to the other end. So GCI last year was about 1.78, which was not a great year. Um, in the peak, it was closer to about 2.652 um, of 20, what would that have been, 2020? And then 2021 yeah. dropped down a little bit as well because we were out of inventory to sell. I mean, I, we, were, we were really struggling. I mean, I had a lot of listing agreements actually even that I couldn't activate because it was, clients were like, I need to have something under contract or at least uh, a glimmer of hope that we can get into something else because we can't even get into a rental. It was so, such a frenzy in our market for a while. So very similar to 05. Yeah. Definitely a little bit more of a frenzy than 05, but, but definitely similar. So in a normal year, if I get rid of 2021, 2020, um, and, and try to look at more pre-boom numbers, which that's what I like to look at, right? Absolutely. I've, I've, seen, I've seen you, and I'm from Los Angeles originally, so I'm a huge Dodger Laker fan, and so uh, I appreciate the Kobe jerseys and so forth. Yeah. But, you know, if Clay Thompson puts up 10 threes, you know, we can't look at that as a realistic day in and day out, right? No, so, we need to look at the average. Exactly. So about one four five to one five five is a very achievable number in a market my size with an average sales price of four hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars. Got it. And that I would have to imagine puts you in the upper one percent of income earners in your town, I would imagine. And so the reason I bring that up, the reason I bring that up, Ryan, is because <clears throat> I want people to understand A, what is possible and B how powerful our limiting beliefs are. Because I talk mm -hmm. to a lot of agents in your market who say, I can't get a listing, Brandon. This is impossible. You want me to prospect? Are you kidding me? There's nobody. And it's like, wait a minute. Well, well that's just you saying that to yourself. So let's get into some details. So you, you talked about 30% or so, about a third of your business coming out of the database, your past clients, centers of influence, what are you doing to generate business out of that bucket first? And then we'll talk about the other 70% of maybe what you're doing to generate clients. So I'm, I'm really old school and I'm not saying that in, in, a, in a proud way. I think old school is great when it comes to not relying on our devices to simplify the process and avoid the voice to voice and the face to face, right? Or I find yep. with follow up, oftentimes people will reach out to the husband, but not the wife. Well, you got to have both. Right. Yep. And so a lot of times it's more important to reach out to the quieter person in, in that relationship, which is oftentimes the female spouse and make sure you're hitting both of them with those follow up phone calls. And so my system, I don't use the CRM. Again, not proud of that. I just I never have. Um, as I told you right before we got on the call, because it's my prime prospecting hours and I've got all the expired listings, everything right in front of me. I'm, I'm calling them, making sure that we're hitting them yeah. right off the bat. Right. And so. Um, I basically have a bunch of sheets of paper, 
I mean, yeah. literally filing cabinets sure. with my notes on them from the conversations, the dates I need to follow up with them. And I switch to Zara? I, I definitely should. Um, we're seeing a lot more um, technology that can be applied that'll speed up the process, of course. But all in all, um, it goes into a filing cabinet. My staff put it into. Um, you know, a, a monthly follow-up. So I have the 1st through the 10th, the 11th through the, the 21st and so forth. And I like to make sure I'm hitting my past clients and fair with, with some exceptions, but at least once every three to four months. And yeah. um, again, a lot of it just, I know they're not buying or selling right now, right? right? But just following up with them, you know, how's your your son doing? Did he get the QB1 spot? Blah, 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 blah. And you got to be genuine about it, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. You, you definitely got to be genuine about it. And and for me, that's worked tremendously and not just in getting their repeat business, but also friends, family, neighbors, ward members, you know, and like I said, it, it equates the last couple of years, it's actually been a little higher than 32% because with interest rates dropping to 2%, it's like everybody could upgrade. So that was kind yeah. of a, a, a unique time that we probably won't see again for a long time, but you definitely got to follow up with them. And, yeah. you know, as, as clients get older, then you're looking at maybe selling to their kids. Um, even with our essential services where we own our title companies and mortgage companies as well, being able to follow up and, and let them know, hey, now might be a good time for you to refi or uh, obviously not right this second. Sure. But just different things like that. Oh, your home warranty is expiring on your home. Do you want to get that extended? It just opens up a, a conversation in a non-threatening way to keep that ball rolling. You know, it's then, servicing the book of business. And the thing that you said, Ryan, my best CRM of all time, I think you'll like this, is a filing cabinet. And so all the agents that I've coached, you know, over the 6,000 agents that I've coached, the thing that works the best is my folder system. It's a physical folder monthly system. Just to your point, that's why I'm smiling because we're cut from the same cloth. It's what works the best, you know, and everybody that has creative avoidance who wants to automate follow-up and auto automate this, that, or the other thing. Well, they're not making $2 million a year. They're struggling from check to check. It's like, well, don't dismiss simple for being um, not valuable, right? The, one of my favorite sayings of all time is simple scales, fancy fails, right? And especially in this business. So you're staying in communication. You're servicing the past clients. We're staying in communication with them. We know what's going on. And so that is just so important because everybody's trying to avoid the face to, uh, the voice to voice conversations right and they want to automate everything so now let's talk about maybe new client acquisition channels mm -hmm. so let's break down the schedule you're prospecting you're doing some different things walk us through what it is that you're doing you can't still be making phone calls after 20 years and knocking doors i mean obviously that doesn't even work right wink wink i mean that's what we're talking about here correct Absolutely. So w when you brought up some stats on my county, so I'm number two gross commission income. Um, and num I've been number one in transactions for I think it's been 11 years in a row. Um, and then I think three of the last five years, number one in the entire state for all companies, just in terms of transactions close. So obviously, I need to work a little bit more on not reducing commissions, right? Let's just be honest, I need to get sure. better about that. Right. And, 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 definitely focus a little bit more on the scripts and and the value proposition and everything else but um when it comes to generating new channels uh, the daily routine again starts the night before right got to make sure you're getting the consistent Always. sleep alarm clock goes off at the same time i'm exercising at the same time every single morning and then i'm in my office by 7 a.m follow up with any important emails that came in the night before but then at 7 50 that's like okay finish this cup of coffee and let's get ready. Put your game face on because when eight o'clock hits, it's time to roll. And that's basically when the buzzard goes off and you know, you can do drills, you can turn the lights on and off, or you can make a buzzard noise on your sound just to, you know, psychologically get yourself into the game mindset. And from there to 11 o'clock, it's just, it's just straight dialing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I actually make sure I have three cups of coffee so that I, don't have to leave the desk for that That's amount right. of time and and just get through it. And then I usually take a 15, 20 minute break, check in with my assistant, see if there was anything to follow up with. Um, and then 
back behind the desk to follow what with any of those that I didn't get a hold of or that, you know, got interrupted by dropping kids off at school or whatever else. Um, and then from there, I go into um, follow up um, with anything from the day before, any offers that we're working on right now. And then usually I like to book my appointments from one to four. And then in the evening, I like to do a second follow up with any of those hot leads. I love it. I love it. And typically, um, with your business plan, how many conversation does it suggest that you need to have on a daily basis? And are you hitting that on a daily basis? I, I am. I am hitting it on a daily basis. And that's something where if I'm in my actual office and, and I can show that and, and send you a picture of it. But basically, I just have a notepad. Yeah. And it's got a, a, a hash down the center. Appointments are on one side, contacts are on the other. And, and it's just the old archaic. I got to make 10 contacts an hour at least. And I got to get to 40 contacts a day. Yeah. And is that what That's you're doing every day, Monday through Friday right now, Ryan? Yes, sir. Yeah. About yeah. 10 contacts on Saturday and about five to eight on Sunday. Got it. Yeah. And so a lot of people that that we talk to, uh, whether that in our coaching community or just realtors in general, they still are trying to look for reasons on why they can't be successful. So when you talk about 10 contacts an hour, we see the average being seven. A lot of agents are like, well, nobody picks up the phone, Brandon. I mean, no, that doesn't even work anymore. But yet again, here we are having a conversation with, did you say the number one agent in, in the state transaction wise? Yeah. yeah. Last year, number two, the couple of years before that, number one. Yeah. And so what would you say, Ryan, to an agent who says, you're having 10 conversations an hour, like nobody picks up the phone these days. Are you calling expireds for sell by owners, just listed, just sold, absentee owners? Who are you calling and what advice would you give to those that just believe in their mind for whatever reason that nobody picks up the phone these days? Well, I, <laughs> just like I tell my 14-year-old kid, right? Excuses are like buttholes. We all got them. They all stink. <laughs> and, oh, I'm yeah. going to steal that. Right. I mean, I don't consider myself to be a highly skilled agent. And again, I'm not proud of that. But one of my greatest strengths is being objective with myself. And it's the skill I'm trying to teach my son as he plays with Olympic development program teams and other things. Know what you are, know what you're not. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason why he's not playing basketball anymore is because we're not a tall family. And it's like, all right, there's five kids on the court. One's the coach's kids, two or six, four. You're playing for two spots. Stick with football and soccer. So anyhow long story short it does work and anybody wants to see the 1099s it works yeah um but it's not what they want to hear it's it's no different That's when right. you know well i want to do the seven minute abs it's like okay yeah. it just doesn't work we yeah. we'd all have abs we'd all make two million dollars a year a million dollars a year and you know we'd all have the same rolexes and everything else it doesn't work that way so That's right. people do answer the phone you just got to call more and That's right. That doesn't mean do that you may not. Yeah, it, that doesn't mean you don't have to call that expired, canceled, or a hot circle prospecting call three, four, five times. That's right. Sometimes they'll. I honestly, sometimes they'll pick up the phone because they're like, "Why are you still calling?" Yeah. Because yep. I would I be doing it. my job if I didn't, Mister and Mrs. Seller, and just you know get into whatever I'm going to get into. Yeah. And they hang up on you. Call back. I'm sorry, we got disconnected. Right. And just you know keep it going and. Sometimes they get really nasty, and if I don't have anything better to do that evening, I'll just drive by on the way home and knock on the door and apologize. You know what? I'm sorry I offended you. I thought I'd stop by in person to protect and promote the image of agents. So I wanted to stop by and just let you know I apologize. And they'll usually just be taken back and open up a conversation with you. Yeah, that's amazing. So 40 conversations a day. So my entire career, I always, the minimum for our mastermind to be in our mastermind of anybody who is earning a million dollars of taxable income, we call it the, the daily 30, right? You can't be in our club if you're not hitting 30. You're doing 40. Here's the other objection that I'm hearing from agents. You want me to do 30, 40, 50 conversations a day, Brandon? I've got one listing I'm taking, taking care of. Can you give people perspective of your pipeline, how many active listings you have, and yet you're still doing 40 conversations. I want people to expand their mindset because it's not like you work with one client here or there. You're probably sitting on how many active listings right now or pendings. Uh, so let me tell you exactly. Let me look. Yeah. And while you're doing that, you, you get what I'm asking, so, right? The agent's I, like, yeah. I can't make that many contacts. I'm busy. So I have 48 active listings. 48 active listings, okay. And which is a low number for me. Sure. Uh, and again, let's exclude 2020, 2021. Yeah, yeah. You know, if we go back to 2018, 2019, that's a low number for me. Uh, there's 32 pending right now. 
Um, and a very interesting set that I have not really had before, even going back to 05, listings in withdrawn status, mm. meaning they couldn't accomplish a goal. Interest rates went up, so we couldn't sell uh, because they couldn't now qualify for their new home or their bill job was pushed back, right, because of the supply chain issues and things like that. So, so I'm working through those, and that's something that I haven't experienced before. So I've had to call more experienced agents and say, hey, what, what other things can I do to get these back out of withdrawn into active? Sure. Yeah. And so you, you, you have a huge inventory, right? 48, and that's lower than what you're used to. And, you know, a lot pending, a lot going on. You're doing this with how many staff members? You said you have one assistant. Is that right? Yeah, just one assistant. So, so the question is, when it comes to high performance, you know, the key thing in my experience has been our ability to not invite distractions because most of us are looking for distractions, looking for the reasons on why we can't prospect. How are you able to stay focused and get in those 40 conversations when you have a lot more going on than than most, right? You've got 70 something clients right now that you're also managing with another human being. So how, how are you able to stay focused, Ryan? So obviously a lot of that comes down to the goals and making sure that every single day you're committed to accomplishing the goals that you want. Again, the schedule is the most important. If, if, if you want to get something done, you want to ask a busy person because their schedule is usually more efficient. They're going to get more things done. Um, and so everything for me always reverts back to having a really good schedule and making sure that you follow it with no deviations. Now, when, when I'm dealing with agents that are selling 40, 50, 60 homes a year, for me, I tell them, no exception, you don't go on a listing presentation at this time to this time because you need to be prospecting. Now, when you start selling over 100 homes a year, you've kind of earned the right, I guess you could say maybe, and I know the agents that sell 400 homes would disagree with me because they're like, no, when you get to 400 homes, you can deviate. Sure. But the agents I see that do over 100 homes a year can get back to the office and get back on their schedule without missing any steps. So like you said, oh, well, this expired just came up. I better go knock on this door. Well, that's an excuse to get out of those phone calls during your prospecting hours or refill your coffee or take a phone call or go to a PTA meeting or anything like that. And I do have to give, again, my staff her credit. She's been with me 14 years. I, I joke. It's like the longest relationship I've ever had with a woman, right? But, <laughs> exactly. Um, she uh, she's amazing. She does the work of four people. So again, I, I have to give all the credit she deserves there because normally I would have to have three or four doing what she does. Just like I guess most agents would have to be three or four agents to get the amount of prospecting done that I do. But the groups of agents that I talk with and hang out with and have been affiliated with in different states, I get, they have no problem doing this either. And they're producing, because they're in bigger markets, a much greater gross commission income than I am. I mean, we're talking in the three and a half to $4 million range sure. and consistently doing it. And so they actually produce better in the slower markets, actually, because commissions usually go up, right? You know, That's it's been right. a race to the bottom for lenders and, and agents right now. And so they actually produce better. Plus, in a normal market or going into a recession, you got 73% less competition out there. I'm not yep. competing with the barber, the stylist, the, the nail technician, right? I'm just competing with mostly professionals. So the schedule is going to be the most important thing in, in getting that done. And then you just got to commit to it and you just got to make those phone calls. No exceptions. I, I don't care. There, there just isn't any exception to that at all. Yeah, I totally agree. So when I coach an agent, you know, we, we build out the business plan. The business plan says, okay, here's how many contacts we need per day. And then we start to talk about something uh, called contact distribution. And we say, okay, if you need 44 conversations, here's where those conversations should come from. In your 40 conversations, who is it that you're calling? Is it mostly expireds or can you break that down on who you are calling? Absolutely. And, and recently it's been a little bit different than in a normal market, right? Sure, so sure. when interest rates were really low, I was really hitting the circle prospecting more because that yep. was just easy pickings for, hey, we can upgrade you and get you a lower payment, um, right? Right now, it's definitely back heavy on you know the, the most recent cancels, FISBOs, uh, and expireds. 
Th- those it. are the ones I'm hitting hardest. So about 20 to 23 percent or 20 to 23 of my contacts per day are coming from there. The rest of them are coming from sphere of influence. And for the last two months, honestly, and again, I'm just being 100 percent transparent. I've cut circle prospecting out, not on purpose. It just kind of happened because I was so busy getting to the, there were so many cancels, so many expireds, and a lot more for sale by owners all of a sudden. So I need to get that implemented back in because no matter what the markets are, I always feel like you should still hit every aspect. Now you might want to change the percentage of time spent on each one, but the circle prospecting lately is, has not for my market proven to be as good. And then, you know, I expect here in the near future, we'll probably add back in the notice of defaults again a little bit more aggressively, right? Because I'm starting Absolutely. to see those go back up. Yeah. And, and just like anything else, markets are cyclical. And so the lead generation strategy is also cyclical. We're coming out of a circle prospecting market back into the expired market. And so as the market shifts, different things pose as different opportunities. So last question for me, you know, I think a lot of people um, really, when they get into this business of selling, they have a hard time understanding pipeline maturity. You see, they want everything off the first contact, and sometimes that's fine. But I'm curious, in your experience of doing this at such a high level for 20 years, are you finding that most of your high-quality appointments come out of lead follow-up or the initial conversation? And really what I'm asking is, how important is lead follow-up to you? Lead follow-up is everything. So the majority of appointments always come from lead follow-up. That's right. I, I don't care how skilled you are. They're going to come from lead follow-up. And, and that's just a numbers game, right? Yeah. If you're talking to 40 people a day, if you do the math on it, most of them are going to come from lead follow-up. Now, again, a really good skilled scripted agent is going to convert a much higher percentage, of course, off that first phone call. Um, sure. But with 40 phone calls a day, and only, you know, maybe let's say 10, 50 and expired cancels a day, do the math. You're going to get more from lead follow-up, of course. Plus then your pipeline, um, those are much easier to close. Um, and if you have a, a big pipeline, as I do from years and years and years back, you know, I go through and it's like, oh, their kids are graduating this May. I mean, I got a stack of those, right? Kids are graduating this May. It's time to downsize. That's right. Right. So I'm going to be following up with them here in the next month or so to get them on the market for the summer season. So um, it's definitely going to be lead follow-up. And I feel like agents changing the mindset to understanding that, again, it's it's like asking your girlfriend out or your spouse out. How many times did you have to ask? I know I had to ask two, three times before I got the date. And then I had asked three or four more times for the second date. That's right. right. And, and then you dated for a long time before you got married. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, and so it's like it, it takes some time to close that deal. And so I usually go into it expecting seven points of contact yep. in a normal market, right? Lately, it's been better than that. It's been closer to three. But seven points of contact um, is about average that I've seen in our market for the high-skilled agents um, yeah. to close to a contract. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because, again, it goes back to instant gratification, right? Everybody wants to call one expired one time, meet with them one time, get the listing. on. It's like this doesn't work that way. You know, It's going to take you... And they don't understand pipeline because a lot of agents will, Brandon, I'm making 20, 30 conversations a day. I've been doing this for two weeks. I haven't got a listing yet. What's up? Well, it's like, well, you you haven't built a pipeline that is mature enough to manifest listings yet, right? So um, if you could, someone that might be watching this or, or, or listening to the replay, Ryan, that's just starting out in their real estate business. If you could give that person advice, maybe it'd be advice to give yourself 20 years ago, the Ryan that's 18, getting started in real estate, what, what maybe one or two or three things would you tell yourself that the new realtor could, could benefit from right now? So the, the one thing looking back, I wish I would have put a better database system into effect right away. And I think just being young and immature and, and maybe naive and didn't know what I was, if I was going to still be doing this, of course. And sure. Um, having a better database system in place with, you know, names, phone numbers, kids' names, uh, you know, birthdays, things like that would have been better because now taking a, you know, where I've done over 5,300 transactions in my career, trying to implement, you know, five to eight years ago into a day. I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, yeah, just pain in the butt for somebody to have to try to input all that. Right. So it's like at this point now, it's almost impossible to change the database system. Right. So I would definitely focus on that. 
Um, I would also focus on um, having lofty goals, right? And, and when I look back at my goals, because I still have the sheets of paper that I wrote my goals on, I said, oh, if I get to um, $250,000 a year, I'm set. I can have a million dollar home, a $100,000 sports car. And then I got to 250 and I'm like, that ain't going to work. You know, right. and later got to 500. I'm like, Shit, that ain't going to work. That's right. You know, and then it just, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And so we obviously can't say, oh, I want to make a million dollars a year starting out and have nothing for the in between, right? I mean, you really sure. need to have it broken down on a, in my opinion, uh, as you get higher producing, you know, and a minute basis, right? I've got to have a goal every single minute of what I'm doing, and then an hourly, and then a daily, weekly you know, quarterly, because then, then it's achievable, right? It's, it's like if, if you're trying to learn how to jog or run a certain uh, event in a certain time frame, it's like, okay, I have to move my feet X amount of steps per second or per minute in order to achieve that goal. Now it's tangible. Now it's like, okay, that I can focus on. If you just say I have to run a marathon in three hours, I, I'm going to get lost and find out I'm an hour behind 20 minutes into the marathon, right? But 100%. if you give me you know, something that I feel like is in front of me that I can put my hands on, it's easier to obtain that goal. Um, and then the third thing really is, again, stop taking the path of least resistance and just understand that if you want results, you have got to work for them. And despite everything you see on the national media and news and everything else, the American dream still works. You work hard, you bust your ass, you're going to get paid. It doesn't matter what you do in our country. If you're good at it, you're going to get paid. If you're good at YouTube, you're going to get paid. Yeah. Right. If so, the knocking the doors, the making the phone calls, as unglorified, unsexy as it is, I would do it all day long. I really, really would. And the reason why is I look at what does it pay me per hour. That's and right. It's the most profitable thing I can do. It's over a thousand dollars an hour. It's like eleven hundred and fifty-two dollars an hour. I am going to call as much as I possibly can call. End of story. I mean, last night I walked out to my car because my house was a little bit loud at 7.30 and had to call four more people back because we got disconnected, they got busy at work, and I wanted to make sure I followed up with them again. So those would be the three things looking back for me that I would really focus on. Again, you know, database, having a really good schedule, and then just not buying into the bullshit of a lot of what these companies are pitching um, because think about it, and, and I've I've owned a real estate company before, right? Yep. I'm, I'm one of you know one of the owners of our, our companies now. Most owners don't like high producing agents because they're a pain in the ass. Not right. because we're creating you know National Association of Realtor Ethics complaints. We avoid all that. But you have the more deals you do, the more crazy people you come across. It doesn't That's matter right. if you dot every i cross every t. That's part of dealing with the public. We use the copy machines more. We're in the conference rooms more. We drink more coffee, right? We use more square footage in the office. Owners want agents that sell, usually, depending on the markets, 12 to 20 homes a year. Those That's are the right. most profitable agents. Yeah. So a lot of times you buy into their, their training programs. And I sit there and watch. I'm like, they're just creating a herd. They're yeah. really not trying to get you to that next level. They want you to be reliant on that company. 100%. Right? So well said. And yeah, I say that all the time. You know, most brokers and associations and boards, it's not in their best interest to tell you the truth. It just really isn't. Exactly. It's not. It's a absolutely. Just like the government, right? The government's That's not right. going to come out and tell us the truth about certain things. And so why do why do certain companies not bring you in and hire you specifically? Is because it wouldn't be in the best interest of their bottom dollar to hire you and bring you in to get all their agents producing higher. That's it right. just wouldn't. So yep. they, they need to look at it objectively and say, okay, forget what I'm hearing all the time from, you know, the national franchises or from uh, the news. What does common sense tell me is going to help produce the best for myself and my family? And unfortunately, it's usually what we don't want to hear, right? It's, 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 Oh man, if I want to get in shape and have abs, I got to exercise every day. I got to sweat and I got to push the limits. That's what we have to do in the office every single day. And once you've done it for a month or two, it gets a lot easier. And then like anything else in life, when you get good at it, it gets enjoyable, but it takes three, four, five months to really get into a groove of anything new, right? It's even when, when you help me change some of my scripts, yep. I mean, I, 
I fumbled it for a month, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but it happens. You know, I, I was doing it a certain way and saying a certain thing for so long that when we changed it slightly, it was like, oh, crap. Uh, even this morning, I found myself text messaging the wrong thing because I couldn't get through to him. So I sent him a follow up text. I had to go back and delete it and resend it. Right. And so it takes time. And uh, ultimately, if you have the goals and the commitment in place, you know, and with your help, they'll get there. Yeah. Well, Ryan, listen, I appreciate you very much. Obviously, uh, you've got a lot to do. So we're gonna let you get back to it. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to going on the journey and watching you continue to grow your career. Certainly you've, you've done very well for yourself. And so we appreciate you jumping on the show. No, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate all your help. We'll talk to you soon, Ryan. Thank yeah. you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.